Perfect. At least both people in Colorado see it, so we're in good shape. Um, <clears throat> so uh, what I ha what I'll, I'm going to walk you through is really just a very bare bones process here um, that takes data from Arctos and makes it available through uh, through various aggregators to data users anywhere on the planet. Um, <clears throat> my bandwidth here is affected uh, by power outages and other sorts of things in my vicinity. So if I break up or freeze, don't hesitate to interrupt me when I come back and let me know the last thing that you heard that was that was moving and 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 uh, life changing for you. And I'll start there. Um, uh, I'll back up and start there again. Uh, but in general. <clears throat> Uh, the key thing here uh, that we're going to walk through is 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 the the data publishing pipeline from Arctos uh, to the rest of the world. And let's see here. So <clears throat> this is the big flow. It's very simple and straightforward. Most of what happens in the big flow happens, as Emily mentioned, sort of behind the scenes, um, and it generally is not anything that you as data publishers need to worry about. Um, unless you're seeing that your data on the on the back end of all of this uh, and the portal side of things doesn't look right, in which case then you need to let us know that. And when I say us, I mean me and or Dusty or Lamb uh, to let them know that things aren't looking quite right uh, in the portals and we'll see what we can do. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, your data is in Arctos um, or will be soon if it's not in it yet. And it moves from Arctos to the VertNet IPT. And I'll explain what that is in a few minutes. And from the IPT, it goes to the portals and data users, uh, data users and or other aggregators, uh, projects, etc. It's pretty straightforward, uh, you know, three-step process. Um, as many of you know, uh, what Arctos does in this entire process. Uh, the top three things there are, are things that are, I think, pretty obvious. You know, you put your data into Arctos uh, in order to help organize, manage it. Uh, one of the key things Arctos does, at least for the publication process, is that it, it creates and manages your IDs. Usually, at least when it comes to Darwin Core, um, the a critical ID there is the occurrence ID. Uh, and uh, Arctos manages those, both old occurrence IDs, if you have them, uh, both if you had them before you went into Arctos, as well as new Arctos uh, IDs or occurrence IDs uh, that are provided to each record uh, by the system itself. Uh, and of course, then there's the Arctos portal. There are some other, you know, there are other benefits to being in Arctos. Um, I'm not gonna go into those. Uh, right now because that's not what this talk is about. But I do want to call out two, uh, two pieces uh, that, are, that are key here. And that is that one of the th things that Arctos does now, and this is a newish tool I th will explain, uh, is there's an EML generator or it's a metadata generator and uh, export tool, which is really key uh, to this process. And then also behind the scenes, uh, we've been working with Dusty for a long time uh, to generate various tables for each data set um, within Arctos. And those tables are an occurrence or, or a Darwin Core table, uh, Audubon Media, which is if, if you've got any kind of media at all associated with your records, uh, a resource relationship. And this one we don't use all the time, um, but uh, it, it is something that we would use for those collections that were published uh, to GBIF and IDIG bio before coming into Arctos. Um, and then all, there are a whole bunch of tables that we've had to create for those collections that are participating in GGBN. Um, so all of these things are happening behind the scenes in Arctos. Um, and these tables uh, are really important uh, for reasons that I will, uh, uh, I will explain uh, as we move forward. Um, I just wanted to give you a little sneak peek, although I, I'm not gonna give away any of Handy's secrets here. 
uh, with the EML generator, but I did want to give you a look at what the EML or the metadata is. And this is uh, a collection of uh, birds, uh, 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 birds, eggs, and nests and whatnot from uh, Wyoming, uh, one of your illustrious Arctos members there. Um, and as you can see, just by looking through this, the, the structure is a basic EML. That's the metadata format that, uh, that we're using in this particular instance. Um, and it's just the basic stuff, contact information, collection uh, information, uh, uh, it's uh, creative commons designations or other licensing. It's basic stuff. Uh, it's all stuff that you will have entered into Arctos uh, through your experience uh, there by moving your data in uh, and then updating it over time. Um, I do encourage you though, as, uh, as you use Arctos over the years, uh, to make sure that the metadata that you have input into Arctos is current. You might even check it once a year, uh, once you've been in there for a while, just to make sure that the, the proper people and proper uh, contact information are listed in, that, um, uh, in those metadata fields. Uh, so that when they do, uh, and when we do publish, uh, those things are always current. All right. So the first big leap here is from Arctos to the VertNet IPT. Um, I want to be really clear about something in that uh, VertNet itself is a project. It is also a portal or an aggregator. And what we're talking about here when we're talking about the VertNet IPT or if somebody very casually says to you, oh yeah, you know, my data is in Arctos and then it goes to VertNet and to other people. That's correct in a way, uh, but what does not happen is that your data are not taken from Arctos and put in the VertNet portal, and then from the VertNet portal, they then go to other portals. That is not what happens. What happens is your data are taken from Arctos, and I'll explain roughly how that works in a few minutes, <clears throat> and they go into something called the VertNet IPT, which is the Integrated uh, Publishing Toolkit. It's a set of software that we helped uh, GBIF develop many years ago that then creates uh, an archive of your data and metadata. So it's not going into the portal and then out of our portal into something else. It's going to this IPT, uh, or me in that particular instance. Um, and then from there, it goes out to the other aggregators. So I just wanna clarify, there are a number of people out there in the world who seem to think that when we as VertNet or I publish a data set that it goes into the VertNet portal and then from there goes elsewhere. It's not the case. So at any rate, it goes into the integrated publishing toolkit software. And the way that that works is we take that EML uh, that's generated by the Arctos EML generator uh, and I manually upload that into the IPT. Um, I'll explain how that works in a minute. And then I also, within that IPT instance or within the resource, I link all of those tables that I mentioned previously that are created in Arctos behind the scenes. So we're doing this, uh, some manual integration and uploading, and then we're doing a lot of automated linking to the Arctos database directly to the IPT. Now, uh, for those of you who've never used the IPT, that's okay. Don't lose any sleep over that. Um, it's, not any, it's not on anybody's bucket list anywhere on the planet and it doesn't need to be on yours. Although if you have questions about how it works, I'm more than happy to answer those. Uh, as I said, this is a GBIF tool uh, that we helped them to develop a number of years back uh, called the Integrated Publishing Toolkit. This is what it looks like on its main page. Uh, this is the VertNet uh, IPT. Here, uh, it's just a quick snapshot of how that works. And what happens inside that IPT, what it does is the very first thing or most important thing is that the IPT is the software that allows us to create something called a Darwin Core Archive or a DWC-A. And that, that archive is essentially well, it is three files roughly at its base. It's your occurrence records. It's the occurrence table, if you will, from Arctos. It is a metadata file and there's an RDF file that allows it to be machine readable um, and uh, allows machines to understand what's in it. 
It can be more than those three files, and sometimes it is if you have, say, for example, an Audubon Media extension or the GGBN extensions or who knows what, you know, maybe you've got chronometric age extensions or measurements and facts um, extensions, all of that stuff, all those individual tables will go into the Darwin Core archive. But at a base, it's those three key files, your current stuff, your metadata and the, and the machine readable file. So the other things uh, that the IPT does uh, is that it gives us a platform to map all of the data that comes out of Arctos and map the fields from Arctos into Darwin Core fields. Fortunately for us, uh, we worked with Dusty a long time ago and he already converts all of the Arctos fields into Darwin Core uh, compliant fields. So in most cases, the mapping is a one-to-one -one from Arctos to Darwin Core. It's not always the case, uh, but we always check those mappings manually after, they've, uh, after the software has done it uh, automatically to make sure that everything aligns. Um, another uh, piece, a key piece of the IPT software uh, is that it, what it does is it gives each Darwin Core archive a home on the internet. It gives it a unique and permanent URL that is where all of the other aggregators, including VertNet, but GBIF, IDIGBio, Consortium of Pacific Northwest Herbaria, uh, anybody, including individual data users, can go and then harvest that Darwin Core archive and then add it in case of an, uh, of an aggregator, add that information to the, to the aggregator's index. So that's the location where all of these other portals go to get the data so that what's not happening is that the portal does not have to connect to Arctos directly, um, which can cause all kinds of security and safety issues. So what this does is it creates a Darwin Core archive, it puts it up a, at a unique and permanent web address, and all the por portals go there to that address to download that archive and get your data. Uh, and then the last piece uh, that I'll mention today, uh, which may be of interest to some people uh, on, the, on this call, um, is that uh, what it, the IPT does is it also archives all of the previous versions of the publication. So, um, sorry, phone rings and this happens sometimes. So, um, when we publish, and I'll show you what this looks like uh, in a minute or so, uh, when we publish your data set, which we do to, for all Arctos data sets on a monthly basis, um, every time that that's published, a new version is created, but all of the previous versions are also saved uh, to the IPT. So if there's something catastrophic that happens somewhere, we have past versions that we can give to you if you needed to renew data somehow for some reason. Although I know that TAC does an excellent job of also maintaining and backing up your data um, uh, in the Arctos uh, management system. So. Uh, generally, there's not a, uh, an issue. But if you ever wanted to see what data people were using, if they're using a, a version that was published two years ago, we would have that version and you could look to see what records were there and what data was, was enclosed in, in those packets. Uh, within the IPT, the IPT itself, um, here's a little terminology that you'll never ever use again, uh, but the, the IPT instance itself is, uh, is called an instance. That's the software, that's what's installed on a server, in our case at the Field Museum in Chicago, which is great, um, and we thank them for it. Uh, each individual data set that's published to the VertNet IPT instance is called a resource. So here is a snapshot of part of what the home page for that very same Wyoming bird collection looks like. This is the Wyoming bird collection resource. You'll see there that there's uh, information about source data and mappings, metadata, published versions, and a whole variety of other things that uh, if we could scroll down, because this wasn't a, a snapshot, uh, it would be most fascinating to you, I know. Um, but this is what it looks like on its base level. Um, <clears throat> look very, uh, for a second, I want to look a little more closely at a couple of those pieces, just to give you an idea of how your, your uh, data look. Uh, and how they're transformed uh, within the IPT uh, as it heads out uh, into a Darwin Core archive. But before I do that, I just thought I'd 
pause for a second and see if there are any questions up to this point, thoughts or wonderments. You're welcome, by the way, to put questions in chat as they occur to you, or I think you can raise your hand if Emily has that set up. Okay, I'll take that as a, uh, is either you all being asleep or everything is clear. Uh, so um, the metadata itself. So when I create an in, uh, a resource for um, for a, an Arctos data uh, data set, and that's what happens is that uh, Teresa or Mario or somebody will notify me that a new collection or a set of collections from a from one or more data publishers in Arctos are ready uh, to be put on the IPT. Uh, I will then go to the EML generator and I will download the metadata that's provided. And then I will create uh, the, the bare bones of a Darwin Core archive and I will upload that EML into that instance, or I'm sorry, into that resource. So that we, that's what we start with is basically a metadata only resource. And then I manually go through because it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between the Arctos metadata and the uh, metadata fields in the uh, IPT. So I will go through and I will clean, clean things up manually and make sure that they're there. I will also often add more information about your collection or about your institution that I know um, that are not necessarily reflected in the, in the Arctos CML file. Um, and I do that in all of those, um, all of those uh, categories that are listed on the right-hand side of the screen there, starting with basic metadata. Um, we always complete data, and excuse me, the metadata in the basic metadata section, in the geographic coverage section, taxonomic coverage, at least to the level of class. Uh, so if it's a mammal collection, I make sure that it says mammalia, for example. Um, the temporal coverage is usually in the metadata file that I get from Arctos, and so I will often fix that if it's present and make sure that it's in the right formats. The keywords are, are fixed. Generally, we can add keywords if we need to, but in general, we just leave it as the standard keywords that are uh, built into the, the IPT. Uh, the associated parties, I also fix. Now, in the associated parties, this is where I add myself and often John Bacharek, also of Vertnet fame, uh, so that if people have questions uh, about the technical issue or any technical issues surrounding the IPT or the Darwin for archive, uh, we can answer those questions. And also so that if there are other questions, sometimes people CC all of the contacts on a particular resource and I get them and I can follow up with you to make sure that you got those messages. Um, in any case, the associated parties often are one of those places um, that the Arctos metadata doesn't have everything um, that you might want to add for your collection. And so, uh, as I'll explain in a minute, well, I'll just explain right now. Um, when I get the metadata set and squared away, I will contact the appropriate person in your collection. Usually it's the, the point person who's working with Arctos. And I will give you access to these uh, resources and I will have you check the metadata to make sure everything is correct. But in associated parties, you may also wish to add people from your institution or from your collection who should be recognized as being people who participate in the maintenance of the collection or our curators or the director or whoever is politically um, uh, advantageous for you to add to the list of people uh, beyond those people who would be the primary contacts for the, for the collection. Things like uh, project data sampling methods we don't really get into those too much in large part because project data are not quite flexible enough to permit more than one project at a time and for the vast majority of collections that are published to the IPT the collection itself or the occurrence file itself contains records from multiple projects and so that would be an to try to figure out how to fish and, and, and represent all of the various projects that have, have contributed. But if you happen to have a data set that is just one project, like a Grinnell resurvey project or something like that, we could set that up very easily 
uh, for the project data and sampling methods to be revealed in the metadata. Uh, the citation is often something just very simple, uh, although you can make it more complicated if your institution or, or collection has a particular citation that, they, that you would like to have data users use. Uh, collection data, again, uh, is, is, is really just about your collection and it really only functions well if it's a targeted collection as opposed to looking at the the whole of the mammal collection at the University of Colorado, uh, which is an aggregation usually of multiple projects. Uh, external links is simple and straightforward and additional metadata is also something that I take care of. But as I said, once I get that squared away, I will contact you and give you access to the, to the metadata file uh, or to the archive so that you can look at it and confirm that everything is correct. Um, another piece that happens, as I mentioned, is that we need to link all of those tables that Arctos creates for you. And without going into all of the, the nitty gritty details of the, uh, of the process, what you can see here uh, in the source data section, which is the top section there, are two of those tables. Arctos, which is the, Arc the Arctos file is the occurrence file. That's where all of your occurrence data lives. On the Arctos media table for this particular data set, happens to be all of the uh, metadata surrounding any media that might be linked to occurrence records in the Arctos file or in the Darwin Core file. So I've got those links. You can see there are 95 columns in the first one, uh, 14 in the second one. And we just basis, in this case, monthly uh, with Arctos, um, because that's the, the time period uh, uh, that Arctos is selected to publish regularly to, to, to the IPT. Uh, then we also do the mappings. And as I mentioned before, most of this is pretty straightforward uh, based on the way that we've set up the tables inside Arctos. Uh, but you can see that there are mappings for each of the, of the tables that we link directly. So the Darwin Core occurrence ta uh, mappings uh, as you can see there, the 95 terms are mapped to Arctos. In other words, that mapping is mapped to that table, which has got a direct database linkage back to Arctos. And it uses that direct database linkage um, at the time of, uh, of publication on a monthly basis. Same thing with the Audubon Media. Those 16 terms are mapped to, Arcto to the Arctos Media table and they get published again at the same time on that monthly schedule. Uh, and then there's the publication piece. Um, if you are a new data publisher and you've never published your data to the world uh, before, there is a, uh, an, an initial step where we take uh, and we register you with GBIF as a publisher. Um, and then once that's done, we can publish the rest of your data sets to that publisher at GBIF. Uh, and that's how the, uh, the IPT keeps uh, each individual data set organized as to the publisher. You can see with this one, which is still Wyoming, uh, that the current version is version 30.46. So there are a lot of versions. We've published this, this data set many times. It's at least once a month. Month if, for example, Arctos goes down and we have to reschedule everything. Or if uh, in the case that happened a couple of months ago, you moved uh, from Oracle to a Postgres system. So I had to republish, uh, I had to go in and, and republish all of those data sets and remap and relink all of those uh, tables to reflect the new data set, a new database, and then we republished. And all of those 30 versions prior to the one that has been is considered the current version as of September 1st this month uh, or this year uh, are archived in the IPT just in case they're necessary. And you can see that the pending version should be October 1st uh, at eight o'clock in the morning um, of this year. So we'll see how that goes. The registered piece is that the G is that GBIF gives a UUID to the data set so it can be found easily. Uh, and hopefully that data, that, that ID is unique, should be, it's a UUID, uh, with some basic uh, information about that. And that's how it looks in the IPT. And then the fun part, 
is that once the IPT is done and ready, um, if it's a first publication, um, I will notify IDigBio that there's a new data set that's available for them to ingest. Um, I will, if it's vertebrates, I will set up a special uh, um, issue in our GitHub for VertNet and request that this, this new Ar Darwin Core archive be harvested. As for GBIF, because it's their software, uh, it's an automated process. So the moment that this data set gets registered with GBIF, it gets harvested and indexed. Um, and when I say that at the moment of it, uh, that's, you have to take that with a grain of salt. Um, with GBIF, whenever something is updated or published, it is pretty much automated and direct um, within two or three hours. It just depends on how many other data sets are being published at that time and are in their queue. For iDigBio, it can take anywhere from a couple of hours to four or five days, depending upon their queue and what's happening um, with, uh, with their ingestion process. Um, uh, recently, it, was, it wasn't working so well, so it was taking five or six days to get in there. They fixed that. It seems to be working again, uh, which is awesome. And so it generally takes uh, a day or two on average uh, for your data set to be updated and, and new, new records added to the, the index at, at, at iDigBio. For VertNet, um, you know, we're still driving around in cars that have holes in the bottom of them and we use our feet to, to make them move. Uh, so we actually don't have an automated in the, uh, in the VertNet index like iDigBio and GBIF do. It's a manual process. So we have to uh, manually kick off that, that harvest process. And so we do that when we have a critical mass uh, or when somebody says, this is really important data that I just published and our funder needs to see it there. So then we do it at that point. Um, as I mentioned, the IPT is public. So anybody with that URL and not that many people have it, uh, can go and download the, the Darwin Core archive directly. As I said, there are not a lot of people who do that. Most people prefer to get their data through data portals because they can sort and filter in the portals, whereas going directly to the, to the IPT website gets you the entire data set uh, without any kind of ability to filter or sort. And then there are other aggregators and projects who aren't necessarily data portals who do in fact go to the, uh, uh, to the IPT address and download on a regular basis. Uh, or for, the, for, for a particular project, so they'll do it for six months while the project is functioning and then they'll, then they'll stop. Uh, but that's, that also is fairly uncommon. Um, just to give you a sense of what these things look like, so once uh, you've registered a data set and it's been published, this is that same Wyoming bird data set in, uh, in GBIF. That's what it, this is what it looks like. There's a lot more to it down below. But effectively, all that metadata that we talked about is right here and present, as well as other information and analysis that GBIF might perform. Similarly, uh, iDigBio does, does the same kind of a thing. It just looks different, different project, different book. Uh, but this is the, the, the very same collections page in, uh, <clears throat> uh, in, uh, in iDigBio, same metadata, so on and so forth, slightly different uh, ingestion date there. Uh, but that was when they brought things back online for IDIO, so they'll, uh, they'll, be, they'll be updating that shortly, I'm sure. And as far as what VertNet uses, we don't actually set up individual data set pages. We just use the IPT metadata view of each data set. So if somebody were to look for the data set information in VertNet, this is the page that they would see, which is the same page you would see if you went straight to the IPT. Uh, same information across all of the all of the portals, all of the aggregators. So there's no surprises there. The only thing that may vary from portal to portal is depending upon when each harvest occurred last. The data may be the data in a given portal may be slightly different than another one. So, for example, uh, GBIF will have all of the data in this bird in this bird data set up to September 1st, uh, whereas I dig. Uh, we'll have all the data in this uh, uh, data set up to August 23rd because that was the last date of, of ingestion. VertNet, uh, I have no idea exactly when we last harvested this, but um, it's probably fairly current uh, as well. So uh, just bear that in mind. Um, as you look at one portal, you might want to check another to see how things look. 
And at the end of the day, what we hope happens through at the end of this pipeline is we have lots of happy Arctos users and data publishers. So that's that's the whole thing in a nutshell. I think I said I'd do 30 minutes, so it's 31 minutes there. So there you have it. So let me know if you have questions. Stop sharing now too. Looks like Gil has raised a hand. Go ahead, Gil. Hey Dave, let me ask you just a real quick question. So you were talking about the museum that had 30 publication or 30 versions of your data set. So that just means the same data set refreshed with data either having been changed, added, or deleted, or records having been changed, added, or deleted since the last time it was ingested into GBIF. Is that correct? So we could consider yeah. those 30 to be the same data set in name or from the same collection, but with the latest data. That's right. Yeah. I mean, essentially what you would do is if, if for well, example, um, uh, a good, a recent example I've been working with, uh, it's not an Arctos data set, but I've been working with the Paleontological Research Institute in, in Ithaca, New York, PRI. And the first time we published for them, they had 3,000 records. And the most recent publication for them, it's over 41,000. Um, and when you look back at all of the, I think for them, it's like 15 versions. Um, so when you look back, what you're going to see is the history of that publication of that particular data set. So if we go back to the first version, um, of version 1.1 or whatever it was, it's going to have the 3,000 records, whereas the most current one would have the 41,000. But yes, you're right. It is essentially the, 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 it is the history of and all of the incarnations of that particular data set that uh, coming from that given institution. Thank you very much. Yeah. Other questions before we have Andy demonstrate the EML generator? That was really helpful, Dave. I, um, that was a black box to me. So <laughs> thank you for going through all that. Sure, sure. And then morning it'll wake up, you'll wake up and it will be a black box again. <laughs> it's true, the further you get away from it. Yeah. Well, anytime people have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great. Great, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Um, so just to be clear, I'm going to run through the, the Arctos EML generator. Um, and this, this tool is for generating the file that we send to BertNet to uh, set up your IPT. And just to be clear, and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong, these, the EML file is just for the first time you create a collection. Uh, That's right. Future changes need to be sent directly to Dave, and they can be edited, but it doesn't have to be in that EML format. Right. Or I can give the, if the appropriate person from the collection has access to the IPT resource, they can log in and make changes to that uh, metadata at any time. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So this will be most useful for new collections, but if you're an existing institution that starts a new collection, uh, you would create the EML file like this and send that along. So if I can share my screen do you guys see arctos here yeah. oh that's the wrong one <laughs> it's giving you the wrong arctos Are you guys seeing the main search page here? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so um, the EML file, uh, file generator in Arctos, it pulls data from your managed collection page. Uh, so the first thing you do before you start worrying about the EML files, making sure that your information on the, um, in the managed collections section Right, is correct. Um, so um, you're going to go to manage data, uh, the tab here, down to metadata, 
and then manage question. Uh, if you have multiple questions, you'll select the one you want to work on. We'll pick our mammal collection here. Um, so note the word of caution here. Um, some of this information is uh, important on how it, data is transferred across. So be careful on what you're changing here. But um, there is basic collection information on the left-hand side. Uh, these grayed out boxes, you won't be able to change. If any of that needs to change, you would collect, you'd contact our, uh, our programmer, Dusty, um, and see about getting that fixed. But then you have the ability to update your collection description, um, how you'd like it cited, your geographic description, taxonomic coverage, rank, uh, mammalia, purpose of collections. Um, we've got preservation types in here, um, and then uh, temporal coverage. So you're gonna go through and make sure all that is correct. Um, we've also got information on your licensing here down at the bottom, and then your taxonomic source. Um, you could have multiple classifications used in your collections. Um, as this uh, box here describes, uh, you can set an order of preference. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have contact information. Uh, you can see I've got me in there. We've got Dusty, our programmer, our collections manager, Jeff, and then our curator, uh, John Domboski. Uh, he created this, so he's the creator. He's a data quality person. Uh, you contact him for loans, you, and he's also the metadata provider. Um, so the other place that the EML generator pulls information from is from the agent records. So it will pull our contact information directly from our agent records. So you're going to want to go to the agent files, um, look up each of the, one of the agents that are in there. Check out their uh, contact information. Uh, primarily make sure their emails are in there correctly. Um, but you can have additional information in there that can pull into the EML generator. So make sure those are all accurate. Uh, but then you're ready to um, generate the EML file. And that is under reports and services. You go down to data services. And then it's here, the EML generator. IPT metadata. Click on that. It asks you to select your collection. Uh, you can scroll down, find your particular collection you want to work on. Let's do mammals again. And it generates the EML file. Um, you can see this is same exact same thing that Dave showed earlier for Wyoming birds. Um, you can download it using this uh, link right here. It will give you a EML file. You can open that in the text editor and uh, update anything in there that doesn't pull directly from Arctos. Um, you can see here um, we've got John's contact information. Um, he has two emails that come out. Um, you could have alternate emails if that's all in the Arctos contact or agent information. It will all pull into here. Um, you can see it's got their uh, web link. Um, here is the collection description. It's under abstract. So all of this can be edited in a text editor before you send it on to uh, Dave, but it's best if you get it all entered into the manage collections section in Arctos. Um, yeah, pretty much each one of those fields that was in our managed collections. It's got a particular section here, coverage. So we've got geographic coverage. Uh, we just went with a description. You can put in actual coordinates if it's uh, refined. Um, your taxonomic coverage, mammals, mammalia. Um, and then down here at the bottom is a, that uh, specimen pres preservation type. So this is some additional metadata. Um, your citation, collections types, question name. Um, and that's about it. So you would 
download that, confirm everything's correct, and email that off to Dave to create the new collection. So are there any questions? Thanks, Andy. Yeah, and again, that's just the first time when you're first getting set up into Arctos. Otherwise, everything sort of happens in the background. So it's a really nice um, automated pro process on our end. It sounds like Dave ends up doing a lot of manual <laughs> manual labor um, on his, but uh, yeah, that's that's the basic flow to it. Yeah, so for any um, new collections that are, they've got their data into Arctos and they're ready to do this, um, you should have your collections mentor and they should be able to assist with this if you have any questions along the way about what information goes where, but it's, it's pretty self-explanatory using the Manage Collection page. Great, and any questions for Dave or Andy? I, I kind of have one, and this might actually be for Gil. Um, or maybe, maybe Dave knows this. I often see in IDIG BioPortal um, that there's been sort of corrections made to the data, whether that's, you know, updating that taxonomic um, determination or maybe coordinate data. And I'm wondering um, if that can ever kind of flow back to collections and if there's a process. I haven't explored it too much, but um, this sort of brings that up. That directly. Well, I'm just, I was just going to say I'm happy to let anybody from my big bio jump in, and then I could say something if need be. I don't. This is Erica. Um, Gil might want to add something too. I think that that's um, a challenge getting any annotations, be they from the data aggregators like us or GBIF or be they from a researcher using your data back into your um, into Arctos in this case, is it certainly a challenge, but I think Arctos is set up for dealing with that challenge a lot better than many other collections who are using you know, a, a database that only they use and that's not shared in terms of fields or other um, technical infrastructure. I think it's kind of up to the collections though to decide what are the high value data quality processes for them. Because some of the things that IDIGBio or GBIF do to clean up your data, you know, aren't necessarily really cleaning. They might be like adding ISO country codes. You don't really care about that. Um, or they might be making assertions that you don't necessarily agree with, like trying to standardize taxonomy. Um, the TADWIG meeting that's happening both at the end of this month and then in September might be a good place to, to bring those kinds of ideas up just because TADWIG has been championing the idea that we should be um, doing data quality tests in a standardized way so that if you look at your data on GBIF and you look at it on IDIG Bio, the same data quality um, assertions have been made. I think I think bio is and GBIF both based on a meeting earlier today um, are striving to be the same with those record sets and those records. And I know that GBIF is working with Catalog of Life to improve their taxonomic backbone and we want to adopt, we want to be like GBIF or GBIF, we want to be together. So that if we're wrong, we're both wrong. If we're not wrong, if you like it, you like it in both places. If you don't like it, you don't like it in either place. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that you know there is a perfect taxonomy. It's just nobody knows what it is, and um, and at some point, you know, it's a science, right? So it's always going to be, I think, a little bit. Um, we're always going to be a little different because, as a specialist in an area, you're going to want to see your worldview, and as a specialist in a the same area, another person's going to see their worldview. So I think that's going to be a continuing challenge, but hopefully with these efforts, we'll get closer and closer to having a taxonomy that um, that everybody can, or at least becomes 
something that closer to what people like. Thanks. Yeah, that makes sense. I was just wondering if there was a way to sort of kind of have a digest of, of what got corrected and sort of if you wanted to make um, sort of go through that and, and make corrections or um, see what's being asserted just to check against your data if that was possible. But You know, for that, um, if you go to your collections record set page on IDIG bio, it will show you a summary of you know, for 98% of the records, we've added ISO country code. And if you, those are clickable links and it'll bring you to the records affected. Um, so it doesn't really help you when there are like, you know, thousands of records, but in instances where it might be like useful data quality assertions, you know, there might be like 10 records where the country was changed. You might want to go look at those. And so then it is pretty easy to do manually. Great, thank you. I think the challenge on the, I mean, if at the local level, it's not hard to write, make changes to records or do annotations and all of that. It's when you get to the aggregator level that it becomes challenging because then you're managing an entire system of users and who is vetted and authenticated and all of that. Um, so that really does, it, it, if there were some way that we could actually um, and I think Paul Morris and James Macklin were working on this with filtered push at one point, somehow communicate between these systems so that it gets changed in your database as well as other people's databases at the local level. Um, otherwise, it's got to come to IDIC Bio and back to you and you have to bless it and come back to IDIC Bio unless we're just going to trust every annotation, which probably is not wise. Um, it's a, it's a pretty serious uh, challenge, I think. Um, Emily, could I throw one piece in there? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, you know, I think um, all that's right. And I know that IDIG Bio and GBIF and, and everybody are, are trying to streamline and, and, and uh, sort of merge these processes so that it isn't quite so confusing. So you're not getting differences of opinion across portals. Um, but one of the reasons that uh, these things happen, and this is just to give people an idea of what's going on, it isn't because uh, each, each individual portal feels the need to be a total control freak and wants the data should look like this and that. That's not really what's happening. What they're trying to do beyond the fact that they're trying to alert publishers to the fact that you know, you've inverted your coordinates or, you know, something isn't quite right here, is they're trying to make, uh, they're trying to make life easier for data users by increasing the discoverability of, of, of the data that's in a given portal. And one of the ways that you do that most effectively is by standardizing what's there. Doesn't mean that they're, they're telling you, doesn't necessarily mean that they're telling you that you're taxonomic opinion in, in your collection is wrong, but what they are saying is that the majority of the community views, views this particular critter as a lithobates and not as a rana. And so we're gonna make it a lithobates or we recommend that you make it a lithobates so that it can be searched for as lithobates so that it shows up and is discoverable for those people looking for those particular uh, animals or records or places or whatever they are. And it's the same thing as Erica mentioned about the ISO code. Some people are searching for ISO code and if your records don't have it, then the portal will provide it so that your, so that your data is discoverable. And so there isn't anything malicious or terrible or politic going on. Uh, quite the contrary is that what the, these portals are trying to accomplish is, is finding ways to get your data to the data users that need your data or who want your data. And, and it's just gonna take, it's, sometimes it's messy and sometimes it takes longer than we want, but we are converging on, on agreement uh, on a lot of these sorts of things over time. And so the, 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 the data improves and the data user experience improves with these, uh, with, with these kinds of uh, standardizations and corrections and flags and things like that. Great, thank you. Um, 
Any other questions before we wrap up? I have a kind of question or kind of comment. I'm wondering, the EML generator is so cool and I, I think that's a great feature to have. And I'm wondering, so GBIF has taken over the old GR call like list of collections and is working towards providing this like global collections registry infrastructure. I'm wondering if you guys have thought about how Arctos could just be like pushing your EML data for your collection level metadata into that. Have you thought about that pipeline at all? I guess I'm thinking for a lot of people, it's going to be a pain because it's just another place to add your collection metadata. But for you guys, it might be pretty smooth. No, we've definitely thought about it and talked about how it would be great if it was automated and we could just push it right in there. Um, but I, I don't really know what the capability is on your side to capture that and ingest it. Yeah, I don't, I mean, that's, I, I think, so I think bio will end up pulling data back from GBIF and we, what we did is we had a list of US collections and we kind of migrated that into GBIF's data. So they're kind of the central repository of information right now, but they do have a, so for indexer barriorum, they're drawing that data as a master from indexer barriorum and they're just serving a copy of it. So maybe, I don't know, you know, Arctos has enough collections within it that it represents a kind of significant source of collection level metadata and they might be interested in, I don't know. There's a, that's correct. Absolutely, Eric. And I think it's a problem that we have to figure out how to solve. Um, there's a, a group of folks right now that's working on a U.S. biodiversity collections registry, and it's in conjunction with GBIF. And if we get to that point, we hope to have the GBIF global registry contain the data developed and sustained by this project so that we can all get US data from a single source and that that source will be sustainable and will be updated, um, by, not by IDIC Bio, but by the collections themselves, either through an interface provided by GBIF and or IDIC Bio and the interface provided by Index or Barriorum at the New York Botanical Garden. And if we could get to that point, then we could just pull our collections metadata, all of these, all of the database systems could pull their collections metadata from this single source system that would theoretically be correct. Yeah, that's a good point. We've, um, you know, it's always the first step in our pipeline, of course, for new collections coming in to check against the GRSI call. Um, you know, looks like it's it's not quite revived, but living um, on on GBIF. But uh, we can make a point to bring that up at our next working group to see if it's worth pushing our our metadata there, um, so that can add to that repository. We, we'd love to get somebody, one of you guys, maybe you or Andy or both, involved in that group that's looking at how we're going to design this because I mean part of it has to do with the taxonomic associations that maintain a good list of the collections in their group. ASIH is a good example. Mark Sabah spends a lot of time making sure that collections list is correct and the people are updated and all of the stuff is updated. We're going to have to find ways to make that work in a way that will maintain because there's no way NSF or anybody else is going to fund us to do this forever. So if we can get a good system built and a sustainability plan that works, then I think that'll solve a lot of stuff for a lot of us. So anyway, we're hoping. Yeah, good continuity. Great. Well, I wanted to um, give big thanks to Dave and Andy, our speakers. Um, thanks so much. And thank you all for joining us. We hope to see you next month. And um, yeah, thanks again. I'll uh, post this recording on the 
our Arctos YouTube channel and um, get that linked up to the arctosdb.org. So you should see that soon. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Guys. Thanks, everyone.